Tell me I'm not good enough. Tell me I'm not strong enough. Tell me I won't finish. There is this intrinsic emotion, this instinct. You have just awakened the lion in me. And so an underdog is just somebody who refused to live in the setback. It is a person who rebels against your reality. Your reality of me is that I'm not enough. Your reality of me is that I'm not qualified. Your reality of me is that I'm not quick enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not linear enough. This is your reality. My reality of me is that all I have is all I need. I'm coming after everything you said I couldn't have. It's not going to happen overnight. Success can be a bitter pill to swallow. Success will push you to your limits. It takes time. It's not easy. Life often gets in the way. But no excuses. I need you to still get it done. If you're trying to achieve any type of success, the greats will tell you about some rough patches. The greats will tell you about some tough days. The greats will tell you about some adversity. The greats will tell you about some setbacks. The greats will tell you about some failures, but the greats will also tell you this. They kept going. They kept going. They kept going. They refused to lose. They refused to quit. They refused to give up. And they lived by the motto. I will win. I will get it done. No excuses. You make a better millionaire than you would a welfare recipient. You make a better millionaire than you would just barely getting by, making 30, 40,000. You like right there on the poverty line. You make a better millionaire. You make a better doctor, a better lawyer, a better teacher, a better activist, a better wife. I don't know, a better husband, a better son. I don't know. I'm just saying stop settling. Stop settling for less. You deserve the best. You do not deserve the usual. So if you're listening to me right now, if there's anything in your life that is defeating you, if there's anything in your life that seems like an improbable feat, you got to smell blood. Once you get that scent like a hound dog, you get that scent. You see what is possible. You see what you are capable of. In the face of adversity, in the face of challenges, in the face of everybody that says you are not enough, you're not tall enough, you're not big enough, you're not wide enough, you're not fast enough, it's in that very moment that the dreams got to get bigger than the disappointment, than the fear, than the anxiety, than the stress, than the overwhelm. It's got to get bigger the dream once that dream gets bigger and you get a scent for that dream You start to smell that dream. There's nothing on planet earth that can stop you. You become armed and dangerous You are the most dangerous individual on planet earth The underdog is a person that comes out on the playing field and says I've been in this place of pain my whole life I've gone without for so long This is the day you make up in your mind where I will take the throne I always say the first thing is, and I say this and I, I want people to understand this, invest in what you understand. Mm -hmm. So if Not you wear so, Nikes. Yeah, you should be looking at apparel brands, mm -hmm. right? Nike, Lululemon, because you understand that, right? If you a workout person, then you should be looking at like Planet Fitness, things like that. Like if you are a tech person, if you use an Apple phone, you should 100% be on looking at Apple, right? If you're a car person, like, but one of the things I like now is FinTech, mm -hmm. financial technology. So everybody uses PayPal or Square, right? That is the way money is changing. Mm -hmm. The way we use using money is completely different now. So I think everybody should be investing in FinTech right now, 100%. But I look at it as, so every investor has what's called an investor identity. Like what you're willing to risk, your risk tolerance what companies you're more familiar with. If you're a doctor, then you know more about medicine. So you should be in biotech, or pharmaceuticals, healthcare. You should, that should be your thing. If you are, again, a, a person who is in software, mm -hmm. then cybersecurity, software, that's where you're going to be strong at. And that's where your strong points are. I remember Warren Buffett said for a long time, he didn't understand technology. So he didn't buy technology. He didn't buy Apple stock until like 2017. Mm -hmm. He's like, I don't understand. I don't even have a computer. I don't use it. Yeah. I don't even use it. All right, so I learned that from him. He says, I put things in a too hard box. All right, yeah. so the, 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 the easiest thing is like, wherever you work at, 
Like, look around. Mm -hmm. Wherever you shop at, look around. Mm -hmm. Every time I buy a product, I'm looking at who made it. So I can go look that up, see if it's a public company, if it's mm -hmm. a private company, right? If it's public, I mean, we can all invest into it. If I can invest into it, I want a piece of it. You know what I'm saying? Just to keep it simple. We don't even right. have to make it hard, right? right? You don't have to be Warren Buffett out the gate. Like, you don't have to be that. Like, Warren Buffett didn't become Warren Buffett until 20 years, 30 years in. So you gotta <laughs> figure out who you are as a person, who you are right. as an investor that take you to that next level. Money is one part of our lives. And we, the reason why people are scared to talk about it is because we're insecure about it. And that's because we don't understand how money plays a part in our lives. It's one aspect. I say that there's four. You have to be physically healthy, mentally healthy, spiritually healthy, and then financially healthy. Mm -hmm. If you're not financially healthy, well, it can make everything else much more miserable because you can't pay your bills. But if you're financially healthy, you're rich, but you have nothing else, more money just makes you more miserable. Mm -hmm. So you need to live a holistic life and understand how money plays a part in your life. That way the, the finances can have the biggest power. And then you understand that more money just amplifies who you want. It's like fire, it's like fuel. It fuels your fire. If you're a good person and you have more money, you have a tool to do more good. If you're a bad person, you have more money, you have a tool to do more bad. So financial independence is saying, I now can make money for myself. I don't got to worry about my job. I don't got to worry about none of that. I can create the cash flow that comes to my house. Financial freedom says money is no longer even an issue. Big difference. Mm -hmm. Because even someone who can create money for themselves still doesn't have freedom all the time. Right. You can be an entrepreneur and be a slave to the business. You build yourself a job. You build yourself a job. Yeah. yeah. Right. But financial freedom says your money is not even an issue no more. Right. And, it, and that don't even have to be a lot. Make your life better. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you don't want to be now just, just buying a whole bunch of Gucci and Louis Vuitton. It's now actually improving your life. So the simplest example would be you start a YouTube channel. We talked about buying a camera. Well, one thing that you could do is you can hire a video editor. You know, you go on a freelance site, hire a freelance video editor. And uh, now what are you doing? You can spend more time making more videos mm -hmm. instead of spending all of your time editing the content. So you can focus on yes. your time. You, you can hire someone to mow the lawn. You bought your time back. You can hire somebody to help get you your groceries. You buy uh -huh. your time back. It costs money. You have to spend money in order right. to do that. But you're getting something in an exchange. And now you're buying your time back so you can use your money as a tool. And you can use your money as a tool to buy your time back or you can use your money as a tool to make you and attract you more money. That's what wealthy people do. And so you want to be able to use money in that way. Again, class of people are used to life dictating them. Man, what's up? How you feeling, man? man I'm making it, man. Well, you ask somebody, well, what's up, man? Just close out on a deal. <laughs> you know, got a couple business meetings. Like, I love attacking life. Mm -hmm. And it don't have to be, it don't always have to be going the way you want. As long as you attacking it. Mm -hmm. Every day I get up saying, yo, I got an opportunity to go attack. Right? Every I got an opportunity to change something. To make sure, turn my last name into an asset. Right? Mm. Turn my last name into an asset. That's cool. Like, own my 24 hours. That's the goal. Like, the person who can own their 24 hours can create freedom. There's nothing wrong with spending money. There's nothing wrong with having luxuries. There's nothing wrong with having the nice things. Yes. But it's a matter of when can you actually afford it. You have mm. to know when the right time is for you to have it because you want to first make yourself rich and then, hey, yeah. blow. If you can afford it, do whatever you want. If you do the three things I tell you to do tonight, I guarantee you whatever it is you want to do in life, you'll be able to do. You will be able to accomplish whatever you want to academically, financially, relationally, whatever. So three things. All right, now I'm gonna tell you the story. I gotta get out of here. And the story is about, you guys have probably heard about this before. It was a, it was a young man who, you know, he wanted to make a lot of money. And so he went to this guru, right? And he told the guru, you know, I want to be on the same level you are. And so the guru said, if you want to be on the same level I'm on, I'll meet you tomorrow at the beach at 4 a.m. He liked the beach. I said, I want to make money. I don't want to swim. Guru said, if you want to make money, I'll meet you tomorrow, 4 a.m. So the young man got there at 4 a.m. He all ready to rock and roll, got on the suit. He should have wore shorts. The old man grabs his hand and said, how bad do you want to be successful? He said, real bad. He said, walk on out in the water. So he walks out into the water. Watch this. When he walks out into the water, it goes waist deep. So he's like, this guy crazy. Adrian, he's like, I want to make money. He got me out here swimming. I didn't ask to be a lifeguard. 
I want to make money. He got me in. So he said, come out a little further. Walked out a little further. Then he had it right around this area. The shoulder area. So this old man, crazy. He's making money, but he crazy. He said, come on out a little further. He came out a little further. It was right at his mouth. My man, like, I'm about to go back in here. This God is mine. So the old man said, I thought you said you wanted to be successful. He said, I do. He said, walk a little further. He came, dropped his head in, held him down, hold him down. My man getting scratching, holding him down. I got you. I know you brushed it out, but I got you. He had him held down. I need you for an illustration. He had him held down just before my man was about to pass out. He raised him up. He said, when you were underwater, what did you want to do? He told the guy. He said, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. Most of them are not doing what I'm doing. Why? Because it's not about where you come from. It's about heart. You come to a place where, you know, being smart ain't enough. You got to have heart. That's number one. Watch number two. Number two, catch number two. I wrote it down. I want to make sure you got it. It says to be, watch this, watch this. We're talking about sacrifice now. The important thing is this. You're right in I'm saying it. I only have about three more minutes. Listen to me. The most important thing is this, to be able at any moment to sacrifice what you are for what you will become. That's the number two thing. You got to catch that one. To be able to, listen to me, at any moment, some of you, you can make sacrifices when Monday night football is not on. You can make a sacrifice, but when the game come on, for some reason, you just attach to it. For some of you, when your favorite show come on, you, you, can be, you can make sacrifices on Sunday when ain't nothing going on. But when your favorite show comes on Monday, bam, some of you, you focus until the phone ring and then you're like, I gotta answer it. If I don't answer the phone, I'm gonna die. I'm saying to you today that there are some of you, if you give up your cell phone, you would be successful. But your cell phone is more important to you than your success. Some of you need to give up your cell phone because the time you spend on your cell phone could be used for your success. Listen to me, pain is temporary. It may last for a minute or an hour or a day or even a year, but eventually it will subside and something else will take its place. If I quit, however, it will last forever. Listen to me, I'm telling you as I leave, telling you as I leave, I was homeless for two and a half years. And the problem with most of you, you never felt no pain before. Y'all spoiled. Y'all spoiled. Some of y'all spoiled. Just bottom line. Your parents have done everything for you. Every time you ever got in trouble, somebody in your house got you out of it. So I'm exactly where I wanted to be because I realized I got to commit my very being to this thing. I got I to gotta breathe it. I got to eat it. I got to sleep it. And until you get there, you'll never be successful in life. But once you get there, I guarantee you, the world is yours. So work hard and you can have whatever it is you want. So I think in the school system, they don't want us to learn about money because they just want to pump out good employees that do what they're told. I mean, if you look at school, it's opposite of what it takes to be successful in real life. Don't make a mistake. Do as you're told. Take tests by yourself. Don't cooperate. Do it by yourself. Do it on your own. And um, the last thing was, uh, oh, there's only one right answer. No, there's tons of answers to a, a problem. So you come out of school scared to death of making a mistake. You do everything on your own. You don't cooperate. There's no synergy. There's no brainstorming. And there's only one right answer. Everybody wants to get the right answer. There's no one right answer. So I think people come out of school paralyzed. I think the school system is criminal in that it kills a child's spirit of learning. You know, some, a child goes into school all excited about, yeah, I'm going to learn and it's going to be great. And then the teacher says, sit down and shut up. Don't talk. We don't care what you're interested in. Did anybody in school ever ask you, did a teacher ever ask you, Brian, what are you interested in? I, I, I never did. I never did. So they just teach you what they want to teach you instead of finding out what the child is interested in and teaching to that. So I think, I think kids come out of school scared to death of making a mistake. They come out paralyzed. They don't know what they want to do because their, their spirit and their creativity has been crushed inside of them. So you almost have to do a whole reprogramming once you get out of school so you can find, so you can find out what, what it is that, that excites you, what it is that, that where your passion is. 
when Robert and I had our first date back in 1984, he asked me, in Hawaii, he said, what do you want to do with your life? I had been fired twice from the same job out of college, twice. From the same job? Yep. They they fired me and they hired me back and they fired me again. (laughs) And I knew I wanted my own business. (laughs) So on our first date, he said, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I want my own business, but I don't know anything about entrepreneurship. I've never been around entrepreneurs. And Robert said, well, I've started several businesses and all of my friends are entrepreneurs. I'm like, great, perfect. So two months later, I started my first business. But the funniest thought I had coming from an employee was, oh, now my time is my time. I'll do it whenever I want. And I'll have all this free time and it's it's gonna be on my schedule. Wrong. No, you work 24, (laughs) seven. I had no free time and I'm like okay so that was a myth I had but that was my mindset as an employee that where you work nine to five oh now I can get up and I can start at 11 and you know if I want to work at night I can work at night no you're working especially when you're starting a business it's 24 7 entrepreneurship is not for the faint of hearts it is not because you're always pushing the envelope right And, and the purpose of an entrepreneur is to solve problems So every day something happens and you're like, oh, I didn't expect that. And you gotta deal with it. And and I also say entrepreneurship is the fast track to personal development. Because every day, right? You're you're facing something right here. It's like, oh man. And you can't back down from it. You gotta gotta deal with it. They say like 50% of businesses fail. And I think what happens for a lot of first time business owners, they're coming out of a job. So they're coming out of an employee mindset. And I I know this one guy, for example, in Phoenix, Arizona, and he decided he was gonna start his own business. And he had been an employee all his life. So what's the first thing he does? He goes and rents a nice office space. Then he buys all the nice furniture. Then he gets a secretary. He hasn't made not one dollar. And he spends all this because he thinks that's what an entrepreneur looks like. Versus go make the money first, then go rent your office. If you even need an office, start out of your home. We all started, all the entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs I know, all started out of their home. But a lot of people I see, they, they quit their job, they start their part-time business, and because they're struggling for money, they make bad decisions because they're just trying to find how to put money in their pocket to keep their business alive. So I, I think if you are an employee, that's a smart way to go, what you just said, to start a part-time business, start learning what it takes, the reality you got to get the reality of what it takes. And I, I came across a study, and it was a study of centenarians, people that had lived over 100, and they wanted to find what were the common denominators, and they found three. And one was they had a sense of purpose. It didn't matter how big or small, but they had a sense of purpose. Number two, they were optimistic. And number three was resiliency, how well you come back from a setback. When you hit that wall, do you fall down? Do you get up? Do you go through it? And I'm like, those seem like the three, the three characteristics of a good entrepreneur to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sense of purpose, optimistic, and resilient. Yeah. If, you, if you're not resilient and you, don't, you can't persevere, do not become an entrepreneur. I need the financial education to know what I can buy. Because guess what? We all need things. And when you have money, you don't feel so bad about spending money because you know how to control it. Now I can go to a corporation and buy the things that I want, that I like, and have a great experience because I can. I can go out and know when I should borrow money. Maybe I use money, borrow money to buy other assets. You borrow money to buy rental properties. I borrow money to grow a business. Maybe I go to a salesperson and I have them sell my things for me. Now you start thinking about things very differently because you understand the way the system works works best return that i got on my investment isn't the real estate investments that i made even though those have made me great returns it's not the stock market investments that i made even though they made me great returns it's not the startup investments that i made it's the investments that i made in myself because for me the investments that i put into my own financial education have paid off many 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 times over and you can't see those returns anywhere else you know, they say that the best investment you can make is in you. And for me, that was first by reading books. When I started my financial education journey, YouTube didn't have this level of financial education out there or just general business education or whatever. 
So I started by reading books. Now you don't even have to pay the price to get a book. Just go watch as many YouTube videos as possible about financial education, starting a business, about increasing your income, about investing, anything related to financial education, go start watching YouTube videos. You don't have to watch my channel. If you don't like it, watch whoever you want. I'd rather see you successful than anything else. So go watch as many videos as you can. You have a ton of videos as well. Once you start watching videos and you absorb yourself into this, now you might want something a little bit deeper, something a little bit more comprehensive. And this is where then start reading books. I would recommend that you go out and start reading, start by reading 25 books in financial education and read them. Find the top five books in money management and investing, the top five books in starting a business, the top five books in scaling a business, the top five books in managing a business, and the top five books of entrepreneur biographies. And it doesn't matter which ones you pick, find the ones with the highest ratings, the highest reviews, and just read them. This is gonna cost you less than $500. But when you do that, you're gonna be able to get an MBA level education without paying the price of an MBA. And you're gonna look at the world, your money, and the way you use your money completely differently once you finish these books. Now, once you do that, you can decide, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna go down the entrepreneurial journey, take the risk and do that? Or do you wanna do it through your job? Either one is fine. For me, it was entrepreneurship because that's something I love. I love that risk. I love the whole journey with that. And I don't mind working hard and doing that. If that's not for you, fine. So for me, that's what it was. I was investing in myself. Now for the people that don't want to be an entrepreneur, it's completely okay not being an entrepreneur. I want to put that out there first because I know kind of the internet makes it seem like everybody has to be an entrepreneur. It doesn't work like that. Not everybody is meant to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody should be an entrepreneur. But if you're not an entrepreneur now, what you want to be doing, and everybody should be doing this, is create a system where now every time you get paid, a piece of your money is going to be invested. And if you do the math, you'll see why this is so important. If you start at 21 and you invest $4 a day, and you do this from the age of 21 until 66, and you just invest this money into the S&P 500, which is the general stock market, and you get an average historical return of 10% a year. This doesn't mean your money grows by 10% every year. It means this is the average. Some years it's going to be more. Some years it's going to be less. Some years you might lose money. Some years, you make, some years you'll make way more. Well, over the course of your career, that $4 a day investment is going to grow to more than a million dollar investment portfolio, starting with just $4 a day. If you go about life and you say, the government's the reason why I'm broke. My greedy corporation is the reason why I'm stuck at a job that I hate. I can't change my life because of X, Y, and Z. You keep pointing your fingers as to why you can't succeed. Well, it's gonna be impossible for you to succeed. Likewise, if you go around saying, I can't have that nice thing because I'm broke. I can't have the nice thing because I grew up in a bad environment. I can never become successful because of the way I look. I can never do it because of whatever. I can guarantee you are never gonna become successful. But if we turn this around and you say, huh, how can I become successful? How can I make more money? How can I become wealthy? How can I get out of the situation that I'm in? Now your brain looks at problems completely differently because of now you're not complaining about the problem, but you're trying to find a solution to the problem. And that's the biggest difference between somebody who becomes wealthy and somebody who does not. It starts with the mindset because then once you change the mindset, you're going to start changing your actions. Now you're going to find out, oh, I don't need to spend money at Gucci. Oh, I don't need to go out and eat every single day. Oh, I can save money here. Oh, I can ask for a raise at my job. Oh, maybe I can start a side hustle. Oh, maybe I can start my own business. Oh, you mean I could actually potentially take my income from $40,000 a year to $400,000 a year? That's possible because when most people hear that, you think it's impossible. Somebody like me could never go from 40000 to $400,000 a year. But until you believe it's possible, you're never going to put in the action to actually make it possible. How is it that some people can become so incredibly wealthy while the majority of people don't? It's not that they have some special superpower. It's not that they own some special skill. It's not that they're so much smarter than people. It's not that they work so much harder. It's that they believe that they can. 
and then they use their time differently. Now the question is, how can you make your hard work the most scalable? Because that's now what will take you from, okay, I don't want to be broke, so now you start working hard, which is great. I 100% recommend working hard because without that hard work, it's going to be impossible for you to see any real level of success. But now you're working hard. The next question is, how can you make your hard work the most rewarding? What can you do to make that hard work give you the biggest dividends and the highest returns? And this is where people say work smart. You know, some people say work smart, don't work hard. I think that's a bunch of crap. I think you need to work smart and work hard. They go hand in hand. Because that hard work is going to allow you to scale your smart work. But you now have to understand, okay, I want to become more financially successful. So now, how do I do that? What is the financial education? What am I working for? When I make more money, what am I going to do with this money? Where am I going to invest it? How am I earning this money? What can I do in terms of taxes to protect my wealth? What can I do with my investments to scale them? What can I do to build an asset? What can I do to build a business? What can I do to scale the assets that I do own? So now you start asking these questions. And I know this is getting very deep in some of these topics, but it all starts with that mindset of believing that it's possible for you. Because if you don't believe it's possible for you, you're right. But if you believe it's possible for you, you're also right. And whatever your belief is, is going to change what output you take. If you can start to identify the craving as its own internally released drug, this thing dopamine, that is a source of motivation, then what you realize is that capturing the reward is wonderful, but attaching dopamine to the reward is actually a little bit dangerous. Attaching. Yeah. This, this is celebrating so the win, celebrating the win more than the pursuit, it actually sets you up for failure in the future. And oh so this God. gets us right into something called dopamine reward prediction error. Basically, if you expect something to be really great, and then it's not quite that great, your dopamine baseline lowers. And that means that not only did you, you feel as if you lost because it wasn't as much a celebration as you thought it would be, but it also means that you're starting from a lower place, meaning you are less motivated. So when I say dopamine is the universal currency of everything, what I mean is it's driving the motivation to develop new currencies. Let's say somebody has 100,000 Bitcoins, which presumably now is worth oh my a good, God. good amount, <laughs> certainly more than it was a few years ago. The way they can register whether or not they are in a position of wealth or not has everything to do with the, the number they see on the screen or in their Bitcoin wallet. But that number is converted into a chemical signal that has everything to do with how much you had previously. So, the, so we could talk about the so-called reward prediction error, how good you feel with an experience has. And dopamine itself is what's driving the human species to create these new technologies. And so while we think of currencies as the goal, it's actually what's really driven the forward evolution of our, our species has been the desire to go seek things beyond the confines of our skin. And when I say the common currency is dopamine, what I mean is the molecule dopamine, when secreted in the brain, makes us pursue things, build things, create things, makes us want new things that we don't currently already have. If people can do what you do, they're going to be in a much better position in life. Doesn't matter if it's school, sport, relationship, any domain of life. If you can start to register, ah, that craving and that friction and that desire, that agitation, that is that I'm trying to impose my will on the world in a benevolent way, we hope, that's dopamine. It's working with its close cousin, which is epinephrine, which is adrenaline. They are very close cousins. In fact, dopamine manufactures epinephrine. A lot of people don't know this, but adrenaline is actually made from the molecule dopamine. Okay, so those two are hanging out together. It's like crave work, crave work, crave and work, crave and work, crave and work. And then you get the win. And some people allow the big peak in dopamine to be associated with the win. And smart people learn to adjust their celebration internally, right? This is all internal. You could throw the biggest party in the world, but as long as you're kind of in, laid back and looking at this, not letting yourself get manic crazy, you won't necessarily crash as hard and pretty soon your system will reset so that you take the day, you clean up the dishes, you relax, you go, what now? I'm feeling a little low. Well, rather than going out and spiking your dopamine again, just wait, understand that the scale will reset again. Can we spike dopamine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, and you've done this. So your example of craving is 
actually what you crave, you crave the feeling yes. you're craving, is beautiful because it would, what it means is that you don't allow yourself to go f so far down the arc of the dopamine trajectory to get to the other source of motivation. So there are two sources of motivation as it relates to dopamine, and then we can think about tools that we could export from these that are nested in neurobiology. The first is to do what you do, which is to be able to sense the craving as its own form of pleasure. This has kind of remnants of Carol Dweck's growth mindset that you eventually develop a, a pleasure in the seeking and the striving. Has a, you know, uh, has flavors of a Gog David Goggins type uh. approach where, where it seems like he gets pleasure from the friction itself. And so there are elements of that, you seem to have that as well. Anytime you have a bunch of dopamine and you're in pursuit, 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 after you achieve a win, now this could be a, a business win, a relationship, a win of any kind, but inevitably there's going to be a tipping back of the scale on the pain side. And that pain side is always going to go a little bit higher than the dopamine side. So this is what you would feel if you pursued a goal like building a big company, here it comes, here it comes, the big sale, and then there's the, well, what now? You have the kind of letdown. Now, if you wait, if you simply wait and stop pursuing dopamine for a short while, the scale starts to reset. The problem is a lot of people immediately roll right into the next pursuit. And then what happens is that scale starts to get stuck on the pain side. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And pretty soon, no amount of seeking will allow you to experience that craving and motivation. Well, when you print money, pieces of paper, without producing more wealth, what happens? The value of each individual dollar goes down. Because you can't just produce more wealth, you can't print more wealth, but you can print money. And so this money, this piece of paper, then loses value. And we've been seeing this happen for, for a long time. Whenever you print more money, the value of each individual dollar goes down, which then in effect causes the price of things to go up. That's why $100 today cannot buy you what $100 could 20 years ago. And that's why $100 today can't buy you what $100 could 100 years ago. But what does that mean when we go back to the topic of you know, the system that we were just talking about. Well, inflation, the whole purpose of it, because the Federal Reserve Bank doesn't want 0% inflation. If you listen to anything that they say, they say that they have a target of 2% inflation. But why 2%? Why this random number? Why not 0%? Why do we want any inflation? Well, because it's their way of growing this system. See, inflation disproportionately benefits the financially educated and the wealthy, and inflation disproportionately hurts the financially uneducated and the poor. Because when you don't understand inflation, well, you're the one that's paying the price. If you leave your money in the bank, and your bank is paying you 0.1% a year in interest, while inflation is 5, 6, 7% a year, you're losing value in the bank. Your savings are slowly losing value each and every day because you're saving your money. Now, this doesn't mean you shouldn't save any money. This means you have to know how to save your money strategically. That means save your money for an emergency, save your money for an investment, or save your money for a big purchase. But then beyond that, why are you putting cash aside? Well, it should be to invest. But now going back to that question of the system, right? What does inflation do? It grows the economic system. It encourages more spending, more dollars out there. And so who does that benefit? It benefits the economy. It benefits the investors who own a piece of the system. But it hurts the people. Because if you don't understand this, what happens? Oh, maybe you got a raise because of inflation. Great. People spend more money. Great. But now you're poorer today than you were a few years ago. Even though it might look like you have the same bank balance. Even though you might have gotten a raise because the prices of everything around you have gone up faster than your income. And that's why today you have people struggling more than they were 50 years ago. 50 years ago in 1970 or early 1970s, you'd have one person going to work, the man of the house. And they would have one income. And the one income would allow a family to survive comfortably, have a nice home, have a nice car, and have a nice vacation. Today, you have the majority of households are two-income households and people are struggling to buy homes. 
People are struggling to afford a car. People are struggling to have any sort of freedom to go on a vacation or really do anything. Even though we have two income households today as opposed to one income households in the 1970s. So what's the difference? The value of the dollar is dropping. This grows the system. This benefits people who understand the system, the investors, the financially educated, but it comes at a price. And the price is at the expense of regular people. This is why now, when you understand this, you have to change the way you look at money and change the things that you do use with your money. Because if you're making money just to spend it, well, now you're making everybody else rich at the expense of your own wealth. What I'm saying is make yourself rich before you make everybody else rich. I don't want you to never have the nice things. I want you to have the nice car. I want you to go on the nice vacations. I want you to have the nice home, but I want you to be able to afford it first. And right now, the most important thing financially is to make yourself rich first. And ironically, the people that are looking rich are sacrificing their real richness. But if you want to actually become rich, well, you're not going to be looking rich when you're trying to become rich. Building wealth is a very simple formula. Spend less than what you make and invest the difference. Period. Now, if you want to achieve more wealth, you need to invest more money. How can you invest more money? You can spend less money or you can earn more money. It's as simple as that. Now, there's a limit to how much less you can spend. There is a limit to how many costs you can cut, but there's no limit to how much money you can earn. So if you've already cut back as much as possible, there's no other way that you can cut back and you still want to invest more and you want to see the returns sooner, then you got to earn more money. Now again, how can you earn more money? Well, if you don't want to do it through starting a business or a side hustle, then you got to do it through your career. Are you at a job that will allow you to earn more money? Are you in a position that will allow you to earn more money? Maybe you have to get a certificate. Maybe you have to go back to school. Maybe you look for a different company. Maybe you look for a completely different career. Maybe you end on a second job. Now, I, I can't answer that question for you, but this is where you just have to be honest with yourself and see what type of life do you want to live and are you being honest with yourself? And then you just plug in the numbers. You got to hear what I'm telling you. You can have whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. You could do whatever you want. But you got to ask yourself a serious question. If I wasn't a scary cat, if I, I, that's right, I'm challenging you. If I wasn't a punk, if I wasn't afraid, if I wasn't fearful, if I lived by faith, what more could I accomplish? What more could I have? And finally, if I stopped listening to other people, why am I so concerned about what they think? It's not what they think that makes me or break me. It's who and what I think about myself that determines my destiny. And so I need you to do me a favor. I need you to live by passion. I need you to follow your heart because if you follow your heart, it's half the battle. The number one thing you have to do is make up your mind that you are no longer going to live in the pain of the past. There will be days that you don't achieve your desired outcome. And that's what separates the winners from the losers. See, losers give up, winners give all. The late, great Jim Rohn said, if you really want to do something, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. Where champions reside, where greatness resides, there is absolutely no excuses. So let me say this again in the powerful words of the great T.D. Jakes. Don't tell me what you gon' do. Tell me you got it done. <laughs> this is a great day to win.